Welcome to the Broken Vessels Podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you back to another episode of the Broken Vessels podcast. And we have a really great guest today and a great topic. And obviously, it's a topic that I've talked to all of you all about before when you've heard my story as I've shared it and uh, many other episodes where we've talked about depression. And so today, our topic is going to be broken by depression how depression brings brokenness to our lives, and what the answers to depression are. And obviously, there's no simple answers to that. But we know for sure the gospel ultimately is the answer to everything. Well, the guest that I have today actually was recommended to me by one of my previous guests, Dr. Catherine Butler, who we had on to talk about suicide a while back. And she said, you really need to have this person on your podcast. You guys need to connect because you guys have similar hearts for the broken. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great to me. So the guest that I have today is Christine Chapel. Christine is the author of a new book, Midnight Mercies, Walking with God Through Depression in Motherhood. And it says forthcoming in October, but I believe she's told me it's actually out already, which is great. And she has also written, Help, I've Been Diagnosed with a Mental Disorder, Help, My Teen is Depressed, and Clean Home, Messy Heart, Promises of Renewal, Hope, and Change for Overwhelmed Moms. She is a certified biblical counselor and currently serves as the outreach director and Hope Plus Help podcast host for the Institute for Biblical Counseling and Discipleship. Her writing has been featured at Desiring God, The Gospel Coalition, Risen Motherhood, and other Christian platforms. Christine lives in South Carolina with her husband and three children. Christine, welcome to the Broken Vessels podcast. We're so thankful that you're here to join us today. I am looking forward to chatting with you today. Thanks for the invitation. You bet. Well, let's go ahead and get into this conversation. And I think one of the best things that we can do is start off by actually defining depression. And you can't just broadly define the term, but I'd like to hear what you would say as far as defining depression. Explain how you believe that it manifests in a person's life. And then what could be the degrees and nuances that could be applied to those who battle with depression? Well, that's a great question. And I think it's probably important for me to say that as I attempt to try to answer what you just asked there, I'm not coming at this from a medical background. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a licensed therapist or counselor, though I am a certified biblical counselor. Really where I'm coming from on this conversation is not only my counseling experience, but most importantly, my personal experience with having suffered from depression pretty much cyclically on and off for nearly, I think, 15 or 16 years of my life. yeah, And so, you know, what I found to be most helpful in thinking about the question, what is depression? For me, it wasn't really all that insightful to Google a list of symptoms and come up with that particular answer. Where I really found the most comfort and meaning was in looking to the scriptures to figure out, okay, how do the scriptures define the experience of despair, the experience of hopelessness? Because those are definitely two hallmarks in depression. Someone who is depressed, in one way, shape, or form has that sense of despair or doom or gloom or hopelessness that they are having to reckon with day in and day out. And so just really on a high level, I would probably offer that sometimes those experiences of hopelessness or despair can also impede our day-to-day functions. 
experience. So some people who are walking through depression may still feel like they can be productive, but there are many of those who feel like it's disrupting their ability to do their daily roles and responsibilities, and they find themselves apathetic or just listless, tired. Inability to concentrate is often something that someone who's depressed is experiencing. And so I don't want to go on and ramble a bunch of symptoms you could probably just find on Google, but I do think it's important just to say you know, more than anything else, I think someone who's truly depressed and maybe not just suffering grief, someone who is really wrestling with a deep sense of hopelessness, weariness, sadness a lot of times, sometimes anger is involved, anxiety, shame, and loneliness. These are all different emotional aspects of the experience of depression that I go through and unpack in Midnight Mercies. And so what are some of the nuances, how that might manifest in someone's life? I think that that response could be a limitless response because yeah. we all respond to the different layered losses that we face, the disappointments, the discouragements, the dashed hopes. I mean, there's so many different reasons why we may get to a point where we just feel like Paul says in Second Corinthians, where we begin to despair of life itself. Mm. Yeah. And so I personally think that depression, for me, it's been most helpful to view it as an affliction yeah. that somebody experiences. So I don't you know, necessarily qualify it always as an illness. But I think when we take a look at the word affliction in the Bible, particularly in 2 Corinthians, we see that Paul uses that word and it means that it's describing an inner turmoil where you feel like there's this pressure inside or that you're trapped into a corner and there's no way of escape. And I think that really captures the experience of depression well, because if you are in that season of darkness, you feel that internal turmoil, you feel that pressure, and it feels like there's nothing you can do to escape it, that you're trapped in this darkness forever. Yeah. I'd like to read just a little quote here from your book that I think really speaks well to what you just said. You write, sometimes heavy onslaughts of grief and trouble overpower our ability to cope with everyday responsibilities. Are you feeling buried alive under your burdens, suffocated, trapped, and desperate for escape, hopeless? Maybe you don't know how you're going to manage the next 15 minutes, let alone persevere through the trials God has brought you to. You may feel as though you are on the brink of a total meltdown. I'd say that's a pretty good definition <laughs> of what it is like for those that suffer depression. You feel powerless. You feel hopeless everything you just described. And as you said, I think too, with different personality types, different backgrounds, different upbringings, it can manifest in many different ways, many different forms and people react differently, which again, I think is why it's very important for us not to broadly brush depression or put it in a box, I guess to say, this is what it is, or this is what it is because each case of depression is unique because each person is unique. So I think that's a good way of looking at it. Now, we see depression and mental illness running rampant in our world today. I mean, especially since COVID. My wife is a nurse at the University of Kentucky Children's Hospital. In fact, they just now moved their behavioral health unit from one hospital to their hospital because they get so many of these kids that are coming in with depression, suicidal thoughts, whatever it might be. And I think that everything that we've seen, even in the last several years, it's ramped up a lot. But the thing is, is that a lot of people think, well, I'm a believer. I shouldn't struggle with this. I'm a believer. I should have the joy of the Lord. If I don't have that, then man, it might mean that I'm not even saved because I'm dealing with depression. And unfortunately, <laughs> there are a lot out there that would tell you that, even spiritual leaders that will tell you those kinds of things, which can be very damaging to somebody, especially when they're in the midst of going through depression. But one thing that you did say in your book, one of the reasons you said you wrote it is that you wanted to debunk the notion that faithful believers never groan, which I thought that was great. Because it's true. So I want you to speak to that a little bit. Is it true that we as believers struggle in these ways? To speak to that, to a believer right now that's listening to this, that's struggling, and because they're struggling, they're also struggling with assurance because they believe I shouldn't be dealing with this. So go ahead and speak to that a little bit. 
Yeah, well, I think as you're reminding me of the fact that I addressed this in the book, the first thing that comes to mind and actually the first narrative that we go to in Midnight Mercies on the chapter on hopelessness is Moses in Numbers 11, I believe. And so when we think about the question, can true believers ever feel like they're having a total meltdown? Can true believers ever despair of life itself? You don't need to look to Christine Chapel or anywhere else. All we need to do is look at God's word and see over. Over and over and over and over again, real believers, men and women, might I remind you that Moses is regarded as like God's best friend. You know, I mean, they were BFFs in today's language. Moses had spent more time than any mortal in the presence of God so much that it made his face shine with God's glory. And even after all that, he still got so overwhelmed by his roles and responsibilities and calling. He got disoriented. He had a total meltdown. And he basically said to God, and I'm not saying this is the right response, okay? So I'm not saying that. I'm <laughs> yeah. not saying, so do what Moses did. Right. But the thing is, is that when we feel overwhelmed by life, whatever it is that we're facing, these responses are squeezed out of our hearts. And our hearts are not inherently good. We are inherently sinful. And so when we see Moses squeezed by his circumstances and upset that it seems like God's not helping him or that God is expecting him to do all this all alone, he basically says, if you're going to treat me this way, just kill me now. Right. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not making that up. And I don't even think that's my paraphrase. I mean, it's a very light paraphrase if it is. But in Numbers 11, he says that. And over and over and over again, when we see Job and Job gets to the point in his walk where he accuses God of being cruel to him. And so we can't look at the scriptures and regard the scriptures as true and inerrant. And then while at the same time making an argument that real believers don't suffer discouragement and despair, they don't groan, they're not to lament, that they're only to experience the pleasant and positive emotions, but never the negative. And the last one, the last example that I'll throw out there, because I've already mentioned Paul and his experience. I mean, the Apostle Paul, who saw Jesus face to face. I mean, he had a thorn in his side to keep him from being conceited by the revelations that he'd been given. So another guy, another father of the faith who had seen more than anyone else about God's glory. And even he got to a point where he said that we despaired of life itself. Yeah. And then, of course, we look to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Yeah, (laughs) where he let his friends, he brought three of his friends, his disciples, and he was willing to be weak in front of them. And I'm not saying that Jesus was depressed by any means, but he wrestled with difficult thoughts and emotions, though he did it sinlessly. He was still trying to grapple with the weight of what he was being called to do. He says, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. As he's dripping bloody sweat, which is a medical condition often brought on by extreme duress and anxiety. And so we just need to realize that the examples we have in the scriptures in no way, shape, or form condone a perspective that says real believers don't struggle with these overwhelming emotions, because that would be to say that God's word is not telling us an accurate story. For sure. And I think also the point to make as well is Jesus suffered in our place. And then not only that, as the Bible tells us, because of his suffering, he understands the suffering that we go through. Yeah, in Hebrews 4.15. Yeah, so go ahead and read that for us if you would. Sure. I'll actually start in verse 14. It says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Amen. That is a comfort to know that Jesus, our Savior, suffered as a human being so that he can understand the suffering that we go through. And brothers and sisters in Christ, that should be a comfort to you if you're going through depression. Jesus dealt with all the same kind of emotions that we dealt with, and like it said, yet without sin. And that kind of takes me to my next question, because many in evangelicalism, they would say that depression, anxiety, mental illness, suicidal ideation, all of these things, the whole gamut, 
But depression in particular, it's sin, or it's a result of unrepentance in, in that believer's life. Or you may have somebody tell you, well, you're struggling with this depression. That may mean that you're not a believer at all. And many times we struggle with that because we're struggling with the anxiety of the lack of assurance because, hey, I'm not having joyful feelings 24-7. I'm in a deep pit right now. How would you respond to those characterizations? I personally don't like to paint with broad brushes about conversations with depression. I think because like we talked about originally, the fact that there is so much about the individual that we need to take into consideration. And while no two experiences of depression are the same, there are definitely commonalities that we can trace. But at the end of the day, God deals with us as we are unique individuals navigating our own stories in our own circumstances with our own, like you said, personalities or temperaments. And so I think that it's more helpful to, and the way that I approach the experience of depression is thinking about that as a response to pain and confusion that we're feeling. And so however that has been brought on, sometimes in some cases, not all cases, but sometimes, you know, an experience of hopelessness or despair or feeling just this sense of dread can be the result of a medical condition and something going on in the body. I think that studies show that more often than not, a diagnosis of depression is typically more frequently linked to an identifiable loss in that person's life. It doesn't have to be death, but could be through a loss of a job or financial stability or some kind of dashed hope or or deep discouragement and things of that nature. You know, so I think if we paint with broad brushes that depression is always sin, then we run the risk of really doing a lot of damage to people who are experiencing suffering. You know, and obviously we want to help people to suffer with Christ and not to respond to their suffering in ways that would really just serve to deepen their despair and unrighteous ways of hoping with the pain and confusion, the doubts and the fears and the question that they feel. But I think having an approach that is much more painful patient and merciful, I think is helpful because like you said, you know, someone who's experiencing depression likely doesn't need any help feeling condemned already. Right. They're, the inner dialogue they're having is yeah. already beating themselves up about, I should know better than this. Right. Why am I going through this again? So there's already that self-condemnation. It's not very helpful to then have that heaped on through external voices when unfortunately that can be the case. And so while I'm not going to sit here and say that sin is never part of the experience of depression because none of us can say that no No, matter what the reason yeah no matter what the reason that you are going through this is we can't ever say we are without sin or else we're a liar as john says i don't remember in one of his letters but in somewhere i think maybe first john we just can't simply say that but at the same time i think the danger of saying all depression is sin is that it may send us on a wild goose chase okay well then what is it what have i done where do i need to repent and what am i not doing right and that can turn into to a morbid introspection right. that really just deepens the despair instead of pressing us toward Christ and saying, look, God, I don't know why I feel this way, but this is how I feel. How can I engage you with this? How do I respond to this overwhelming feeling in a way that invites Christ into the conversation and helps me to set my hope and my trust in him and not a change in circumstance? Amen. Amen. That whole idea of going on the sin hunt, the whole idea of, well, we got to get to the root of the problem. I've experienced this in different counseling contexts where it's all about, we got to get to the root. And usually it's some kind of particular sin in your life. And that's the reason you're dealing with this. I think that's an oversimplification of the cause because there can be a myriad of things that are causing what you're going through depression wise. The truth of the matter is we just read about Jesus and you talked about the garden and what was Jesus doing? He was praying profusely and he even said to the father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I mean, Jesus was battling internally yet without sin. He was the son of God. So to say that the internal battle that we face when we're dealing with extreme depression or circumstances, even that in and of itself is not sin. It's part of the experience of being human, being a person. Now, like you said, and I've said 
several times on this podcast, we are dealing with the effects of the fall. We are dealing with a broken, fallen world. Many times, the reason we're going through depression is because of some kind of sin in our lives, or it could be sin that somebody else committed against us, or it's just the result of the brokenness of the world. Or I would venture to say a lot of times it's all of that that is really behind the depression that we face. But just because those may be the causes or what's undergirding the depression that we're going through, that doesn't mean that we're without hope. And we're going to get to that shortly. Now, how does depression and the effects of it, including the stigmatization within the faith community, because many people in the church will stigmatize people. It's almost like you're part of the leper community because you deal with depression or anxiety, or you're dealing with suicidal ideation, and people within the faith community have not dealt with that. They don't really understand it, or again, they look at it as being this sin problem. So how does that, that stigmatization within the faith community, and just for us ourselves, bring brokenness to us as believers who suffer with it? So talking about the brokenness that it brings to us when we want to try to reach out for help, but then we're afraid to because we're afraid of being stigmatized. Yeah, well, I think when I hear you say brokenness, what I really hear is shame. Yeah. So what is that experience of shame that comes when somebody realizes that they are going through a season of depression and perhaps they have been courageous in their reaching out and asking for help and perhaps that request for help wasn't met with the compassion of Christ for those who are struggling in any way, in any fashion, right? I mean, his comfort towards us is for any and all afflictions, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1. And so while that is how Christ engages with us, that's not necessarily how his body engages with us when we disclose that we are wrestling with difficult thoughts and emotions, that maybe we've been given a diagnostic label of some kind of disorder or we're coming out of a hospitalization. You know, there's so many different things that can be going on. Right. And so that's a painful reality that actually, when you talked about feeling like a leper, I was shaking my head because I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh yeah, I've been there. (laughs) Yeah, I remember going to church and I don't want to say this was because people made me feel this way, but I just had this sense of, I had a label on my chest that said unclean, just like lepers had to do when they're walking. Yeah, it's almost like a scarlet letter. Yeah, you know, and the lepers had to walk through the community on their way out of town and shout, unclean, unclean, so that people would stay away from them and not catch what they had. And so there's definitely that sense going on. And so I think when we're thinking about how shame just really compacts the suffering of someone who's going through depression, I think that it's important for us to remember that even though the body of Christ and individual members may sometimes misapply God's word or they may be foolish in their ministry and handling of despondent saints. God's word will never misunderstand or mishandle you. Right. Jesus does not misunderstand or mishandle his despondent saints. Amen. And that's where sometimes we may think that how other people are engaging us is a reflection of how God engages us. And the reality is that his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and that he is not like those who maybe have mishandled and mistreated us in the past. And so again, as painful as it is to be in community sometimes when you're walking through depression and the temptation is to self-protect and say, look, they can't fix this kind of problem. Why even bother inviting someone in? Right. You know, we need to at least start with being authentic with our Lord Jesus Christ through his word to the best that we can. But I also want to caution, look, when you're in depression, you're not going to be seeing Jesus clearly and you're going to have a real hard time registering his word clearly. So it can feel like a catch-22 right. when you're trying to battle because you want to be near the Lord, but he feels so far away. You want to be receiving the ministry of his people, but it seems like they don't understand. And so it is a tension that you have to navigate, but it's a fight worth fighting for because you cannot kick against and survive hopelessness on your own. You right. cannot isolate and then expect to grow through the depression that you're growing through because God hasn't designed you to flourish in that way. I really appreciated the emphasis on community as being the steps to being able to get through the dark night of the soul, the midnight of the soul. And your book is Midnight Mercies. God is there mercifully with us at midnight as well as in the day. But how does God typically work? He works through his people. It has to be within the church and the community of faith. But there's that fear 
you said it well, like a lot of times, like for you, you didn't know if you were doing this to yourself or if people were making you feel that way. I completely relate to that. Walking in the church door and you just think everybody's staring at you like you're a weirdo or you're the worst person in the world. And I do think a good portion of that is in our own minds. But I also believe that there are people in the church that make you feel that way, like you're less than. And so that kind of takes us to the next question. How can the faith community, the church, do better in addressing these issues and supporting these people that are broken and hurting and need help? My own personal experience is that there were times where it's just like I longed for people to just be there for me and help me, but I didn't even have the strength to ask or I was afraid to. But in the end, that was the thing that God used (laughs) to bring me out of the pit was his people, people that actually genuinely graciously loved me. So let's go ahead and speak to that. What have you seen or what do you think it is that the church can do better to be able to help people? Well, when I even think back to my own story and, you know, those days in particular before Midnight Mercy. So in Midnight Mercies, I kind of relive a week of my life where I was actually in the mental hospital. And so the season before that and struggling with postpartum depression as I was, I really was so helped by the reality that my pastors were not silent on the real life challenges of believers who wrestle with despair, hopelessness, and depression specifically. I mean, they would even talk about their own experiences. And so from the pulpit on Sundays, there was this sense of vulnerability that we can be open and talk about how hard it is to live life in a fallen world with fallen bodies, fallen relationships, fallen circumstances, you know, of course, all in God's providence, but spiritual warfare going on at the same time. That he allows, you know, he has, of course, got it under control, but he allows those challenges also. And so there's so much going on. So I think setting the tone from Sunday morning messages, creating an atmosphere of vulnerability where it's not looked down upon to say, I'm really struggling right now with something that is surprising to me and I'm feeling overwhelmed. I think another thing, too, just apart from having that kind of culture in the church where pastors are willing to be vulnerable, just like. Jesus was, just like Paul was. Mm -hmm. I mean, even Peter, you know, so we think back to the fathers and we realize that they were willing to be vulnerable. I mean, even Paul was like, I do the thing that I don't want to do and I don't do what I do want to do. You know, he's being vulnerable in that internal flesh and spirit struggle. But then too, fostering a sense of community, small groups, really. I mean, to be known by a handful of people who can recognize when you're not there on Sunday and they can check in and say, hey, what's up? I was expecting to see you when you're not there. Are you okay? Or somebody that can be there at your house in five minutes flat and sit with you as you're crying on their shoulder or you're having a bad day or they can bring you a meal. And so when we isolate and we withdraw from the body of Christ, we cut ourselves off from all of those different means of sustaining grace that God gives to us mercifully to help us to endure the dark season that we are in. And so I think community and vulnerability are two major things, but also too, the last thing I'll say is to have the leadership in the church understand the importance of equipping the saints for the work of soul care ministry yeah. is very important because if the leaders are not training the lay people, it doesn't have to be, you know, seminary or anything like that, but just saying, look, this call isn't just on the leadership. It's everyday believers who are called to disciple one another, to bear one another's burdens, to encourage one another so that we don't get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You know, and all of the one another's that we see in the New Testament, if there was more of a stress on that, I think cumulatively everything that I've said would go a long way in helping people not to feel alone and not to feel like they're weirdos, you know, because they are struggling in the ways that they are. Yeah. I think that whole idea of bearing one another's burdens is so pivotally important for people that are going through depression, anxiety, PTSD, whatever it may be that they're dealing with. And it's not walking in front of them to lead them. It's not walking behind them to push them. It's walking alongside them, holding their hand and just saying, hey, I'm here. I think that is what it means to walk through the dark night of the soul with those that are suffering. And it's not easy to do that. Don't get me wrong. It's a hard thing to do because many times those people 
we just talked about. People react in different ways because of what they're going through. And sometimes they may not even react very well to you. They may lash out, but you love them through it because they need it. One other thing I'd like to say too is I really love this quote from your book. And I think this is important for you, the listener, to hear. Your need for help is not a character flaw. It's God's design. Can you speak to that just a little bit, Christine? Yeah, well, I think for me, that's what I felt like it was, was that I was deeply flawed. And I think when we talk about this, it's important to recognize that, look, we are sinners. Of course. We are born under sin. And so we are sinners. However, in Christ, God gives us the title of saints, and he has designed his saints to be needy. We need the body of Christ. In fact, we need God's grace, his power, his mercy, his love, all of the things. Like we are fully dependent on God, and depression just happens to be one of the many afflictions where we sense that need more acutely than when things are going great, and we feel like we're fine, and everything's going the way that we want it to, and we're like, oh, well, thank you, Lord. I'm very thankful, but I really don't need you today. So, you know, I've got this. And so that's something I think that's important to acknowledge, but it is God's design that we would be dependent, interdependent on one another in the body of Christ. And he talks about in Corinthians, I can't remember if it's one or two, where Paul talks about the members of the body and how all of the members are necessary for the body to flourish. And so there's no member that's not necessary. And depression will totally try to convince you, you know, the darkness Satan will tempt you. I mean, the self-condemnation you're feeling and the hopelessness you're feeling will tempt you to believe the lie that everyone will be better off without you because you're yeah. dispensable. Yeah, and you, you, know? have, you have that feeling of, I don't want to be a burden on people. That's the thoughts that I can remember going through my mind. I don't want to burden other people with my problem. But that's what God calls us to do. <laughs> is to burden one another with those burdens and carry them together. Well, and it's a sign of humility for the person who is feeling like the burden. Oh, yeah. Is will we, in pride, keep it to ourselves and feel like we can just have a sip of our lip and strengthen our weak knees and not crumble under this pressure? Or will we, in humility, say, you know what, I don't got this. Right. I'm not sufficient in myself. I don't know what to do. I don't have the wisdom. I need someone to be here with me to help. And that's really hard for all of us. Look, everyone has a hard time asking for help, especially when it's clear that you're not knowing what to do. You know, because all of us want to feel like we've got a grip on things. And sometimes God ordains our circumstances to make it very obvious to us because, look, he's not surprised. He's not surprised we don't have a grip because he knows (laughs) that our grip is a lot more flimsy than we think it is. But sometimes what we face in life where it becomes clear that, look, I don't have a strong grip. I thought I did, and I really do need help. And so it's not wrong to reach out and ask. In fact, that could be for some people today listening, that may be their next feeble step forward is to say, look, I know I'm scared to say something. I'm scared to reach out. But God, I know this is what you want for me today. And I'm going to trust you with that attempt. And then recognize that anyone who mishandles or mistreats in the process is not a reflection of your character, Lord. Just help me. Help me to find someone who I can trust who can walk me through this season. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to close our time together by just asking you, and we've already kind of alluded to a lot of these things throughout the conversation, but specifically, what was it that really helped you personally? I mean, you went, and I know you describe a lot of this in your book, and by the way, buy the book. It will bless you, I'm sure, but just kind of a Cliff Notes version of what it was that personally helped you and what you think it would be that will help others who suffer in this way come to that place of hope and healing where you've come to and just share a little bit of that experience with our listeners. Yeah, well, I think without giving too much away from the book, I really land, you know, at the yeah, beginning. Yeah, definitely no book. spoilers. <laughs> yeah, no spoiler alerts, okay? Because I do share a story of the kind of the watershed moment where the Lord met me in the mental hospital and pretty much my life changed right after that. And so I share that, but what I will kind of summarize, and I think the whole book of Midnight Mercies really gets at, is that all along and all of my years of struggling and my response to that struggle was try harder, 
try harder. Yeah. You know, I'll figure it out. I can do better next time. I've learned my lesson. I won't fall into this pit again. And so the cycle continues. Yeah. So you'll do good for a little while and then something will happen and you'll fail. And then the whole downward spiral of all the negative thoughts and the pain and confusion intensifies. And so that was pretty wearying and frustrating and discouraging too for so long having to think that I could fix myself by faith if I just did the right formulas of this that and the other then I won't feel these distressing feelings anymore and what God really like he so often does brings us to the end of ourself the end of our power our wisdom our strength our whole sense of our world he brings us to the end like for me I had tried so hard to work myself out of depression and all along he was asking me to walk with him through it and that's what we see over and over again in midnight mercies is God meeting his saints in the midst of their overwhelm their despair their hopelessness their helplessness their anger their frustration their cynicism their bitterness and he engages them in a merciful and compassionate way and he shows them what's the next step here this is how you're feeling you're feeling hopeless you're feeling weary you're sad or angry or anxious or ashamed or lonely what do you do now? And he shows us what's the next step in front of us. And he's so much more patient than we are with ourselves sometimes because we want things to be fixed fast. So many times we count his slowness. It seems like he's slow to help us when really what we're seeing is his patience, his perfect patience towards us, because he knows that the more that we walk with and wrestle with what it is that we're going through, then the more deeply we can come to experience intimacy with him in the midst of our suffering. The intimacy is an experience experience once we're delivered from the suffering, but it's in that fire. It's in that belly of affliction where Jonah had his watershed moment. I mean, it's always in the fires where we truly sense the presence of our Savior with us. And so I think that's what the takeaway was for me is stop trying to work yourself out of the depression and let's start seeing what's the next step that you can take today to walk with God through it. Yeah. And I think it's really important. You made the point. This isn't a quick fix, easy overnight change. You may be struggling with depression, and even though you have the nuts and bolts of the gospel and gospel community, it's going to be a process. It could take months. It could take years. You have to just look to Christ, (laughs) look to the gospel, look to his people who are being loving and gracious towards you and helping you walk through this and understand that there are no quick fixes. A lot of times in my mind, it was like, why can't God just hit me with a lightning bolt and just zap me and make it all better? That's not the way God works. (laughs) And I think we can see that, like you said, like with Paul. Look at Paul. It was later in his life when he said, I have this thorn and I asked God to take it away and he wouldn't take it away. And why? To keep me from becoming prideful. Or we look at Job, Jeremiah, all of these people in scripture. There is no quick fix. Even if you're God's child, it's not going to just change. We're not word of faith people here. <laughs> you know, we're not saying that your faith is somehow going to just fix everything. No, it's looking to the gospel, resting in Christ, understanding that he's there for you, and learning that lament is actually not a bad thing. And Christine, you alluded to this earlier, but you even have an appendices or an appendix in your book where you talk about lament and prayers of lament. Talk to our listeners about the importance of lament and how that's actually a biblical thing. Yeah, well, I know a lot of times lament might be considered when we're dealing with loss in terms of the death of someone. And so, of course, lament can be a means of God's grace to us then. But I really think that its application in the context of depression is so key because what can happen is that, especially as believers who know that the Lord is our ever-present help in times of trouble, we may say, well, okay, if he is, then how come I've asked for help so many times and it seems like he's not doing anything? Yeah. And I'm not saying that that's a right response Again, but that's the honest response that I yeah. think those of us who have gone through depression, like you just said, can resonate with. Is if he says and promises he's going to help me, well, this doesn't feel like help. You know, and my week in the mental hospital didn't feel like help at the time. It felt like abandonment, you right. know, but by the end of the week, which what I share in Midnight Mercies is that really God did not immediately deliver me from my melancholy, but he delivered me from myself and right. the view that I had that it was up to me to figure out how to suffer my overwhelm perfectly, how to have 
have a level of emotional prosperity, how to only experience the pleasant emotions. And that's just not a view that the scriptures offer, particularly when a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. Amen. <laughs> that used to be songs that were sung corporately by the religious leaders. Yeah. You know, I mean, the religious leaders, aka our pastors, right? If you would equate the Old Testament to now, from the pulpit, you could say, were confessing and corporately expressing these prayers of grief and sorrow and longing yeah. and justice, crying out for justice. I mean, there's so much groaning in God's word. And I think just our own, to some degree, maybe our prosperity, American culture yeah. that we have has muffled that down. But again, we're not going to find the scriptures unrealistic about how hard it is to navigate life in a broken world. The scriptures are more realistic than anything you're going to find on YouTube or Google or your friend's house, anywhere. It's more realistic about the experience and lament is such a key component all throughout the scriptures to the degree that even our Savior on the cross as he was taking his last breaths quoted from a psalm of lament when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. So we cannot take the prayers of Jesus and then stand and say that these are not to be spoken by Jesus's people. Right. That these are words he gives to us, not because he needs to hear us say them, because we need the experience of saying them to him. That right. is part of the healing process, articulating that inner angst that we feel and engaging him with it, because that's a form of abiding. And if we're not abiding and worshiping in spirit and truth and to worship in truth means to be authentic with your experience, not to pretend like I'm really having a hard day, but in my prayer life, I'm going to pretend like everything's fine and I'm all good with God. No, we come before him and worship in spirit and truth by authentically engaging him through lament. And that becomes then a vehicle, especially in depression, where we don't just get stuck in complaint. Right. And we don't just downward spiral in despair as if we have no one to turn to, but that we engage God by asking for help and then take that next step and commit to trust whatever it is that we're going through, even our overwhelming emotions, that we entrust those things to God while we continue to ask for his strength to do good. That's the last component is that we want to entrust ourselves to a faithful creator while doing good, even as we suffer as Christians. Yeah, and that means even when you don't feel like God is there. Even when you don't feel like the objective truth of his love for you is real, you're not going to feel that immediately. It is basically just having to objectively say yes, agreeing with God. Yes, God, you are there. That's trust. It's not feeling. It's the objective truth. <laughs> yeah, we're called to know God's love. We're not called to feel God's love. Right, the scriptures right. often talk about by this, you know love is that Jesus Christ laid down his life for you. Amen. So that's what a lot of times we have to help people to figure out is what is your this? By this, meaning a change in my circumstance, that's how I know God loves me. So what is your this? What is God's love in your definition or your perspective being dependent on right now? Is it a change in circumstance? Is it deliverance from depression? I mean, it can be a bunch of different things, but the scriptures say no. The one single this that you can rely on that says, yes, God loves me, is he sent his son to die for me. If your this is anything else other than that, it's not going to be strong enough to sustain you in times of suffering and despair and hopelessness. Your this has to be defined by Christ's sacrifice for you and then his resurrection, not a change in circumstance. Amen. Well, there's no better place to end a conversation about depression than the gospel, <laughs> than Jesus Christ for you. So Christine, thank you so much for joining us for the Broken Vessels podcast. Would you like to point our listeners to, I already kind of mentioned it, but maybe you can just share your podcast and any other ministries that you may be involved in right now, your website and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, you can find out about my ministry and connect with me at my website, which is Christine M as in Michelle, chapel, two P's, two L's dot com. So Christine M chapel dot com. And there I have the podcast that I've been hosting for over four years now called the Hope and Help podcast. And that is now at the Institute for Biblical Counseling and Discipleship. So that's the organization that I work for and also have a navigating depression workshop series available on my website, which is an on-demand and video course oh, great. that is another resource that people can access. And then I have, you know, links to my books and resources and different articles I've written. All of that stuff is there on the website. Wonderful. And Midnight Mercies is now available. So if you all want to check out Christine's book, I'm sure you can find it on Amazon and 
probably anywhere else. So yeah, and it's an audio book as well. So digital paperback and available in audio. That's well. awesome. Yeah, because that's the way I read books is I listen to them. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> well, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to thank you so much for joining us for the Broken Vessels podcast. And if you're suffering depression, if you're suffering with anxiety, if you're suffering with any kind of mental illness, even there is hope for you. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ and in his people. And it doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight, just like we said, but you can look to Christ, you can trust Christ, and you can trust that God loves you and that he's there for you and with you. Look to Christ, (laughs) rest in him and trust in the objective truth, not your feelings. I'm sure Christine would be more than willing if you reached out to her, maybe by way of email or other ways, and just look at her resources. I'm sure that they will bring you hope and comfort in Christ. I want to thank you all for joining us for the Broken Vessels podcast, and we'll see you next week. (laughs) 